I'm honoured to launch this document. It has a fingerprint on the front. That, I think, is Joe Curtin's fingerprint. But what you won't notice is the fingerprints of Brendan Halligan because he was wearing gloves at the time. <laughs> and no doubt his hands were all over it. Actually, one of the most interesting and one of the most hopeful aspects of this report is in that introduction, which sets out maybe the various parties who've been involved in the thinking behind this document, including our own St. John O'Connor in the department, including the European Climate Foundation, the likes of Jeff Colley from the media, and a whole range of other people from this city and this country. And I think that gives me great hope, because we can in this country, when we turned our mind to something, act quite quickly and quite decisively. We're a small country, we connect well together, and once we agree on what the purpose is, I think then we can act quite quickly. And I think what we're seeing in that front page, list of names, is a common purpose and a common understanding of what the opportunity is here to reduce our emissions and create employment. I want to very briefly, if I can, just set out in very broad terms the three areas where I think our department, uh, Department of Energy, has the potential to help this country back out of economic difficulties. There are three big views, but it's, um, it's where I think, as well as the everyday role we have in terms of providing competitive, clean and secure power supplies to other industries, we have actually in our area the opportunity for lending and spending and expansion and growth that is truly sustainable. And it seems to me there's three major areas or three major components where we can do that. Firstly, if you look at what we have in this country, what's our comparative advantages? One of the advantages we have is that a large number of the very leading ICT companies in the world are based here and are now doing quite leading research, particularly in the area in the meeting point between communications technology and energy efficiency. And I think we have, along with that body of companies here and Irish companies who are doing research in that area, we also have a utility, the ESB, who've, inv who've invested significantly in their distribution network in recent years and are now setting themselves on a very clear task of developing an Irish smart grid that will be one of the most advanced in the world. It has the scale where we can do it. We have the software systems already in place which you can rest that upon. So what the ESB is doing in, saying, in putting out now some 8,000 smart meters in advance of the national rollout to every house, what it's doing in terms of its clear commitment towards to putting in an electric vehicle uh, support system here, allows us to create the opportunity to develop some of the software technologies, the communication technologies that will be required in that smart grid development. And we then sell those to the rest of the world. We're not going to be good at everything. We're not going to make too many cars. We're not going to make the batteries probably. But what we can do very well here is make the communications and software technology that is needed to make those systems work. And that should be our aim of where our comparative advantage, where our excellence, where our opportunity lies for employment and a continuation of the success we've had in foreign direct investment and development of our own companies. That's the first big economic opportunity in energy as I see it. The second one, I'm taking my lines here from Brendan Halligan. He gave an excellent speech last week, uh, going back to Whitaker and his foresight some 50 or 60 years ago, looking to see what is our other comparative advantages. He saw at the time, I think, a comparative advantage because of our climate in food, in grass production, and converting that into a food industry which we could then export, which we now do 80% of the food we create. Well, if you're looking on that sort of basis, that strategic view of where is our comparative advantage today, you would clearly see, in a European and indeed in a world context, that it's our renewable resources us, we have an abundance above other countries which we can tap into and export. There is no reason in 20 years' time we shouldn't be exporting, in my mind, some 80% of our renewable electricity production to the rest of the Europe who is not equally graced with such resources. So that's the second big project in energy that I see where there's huge economic opportunities. Onshore and particularly as we move into the ocean, where our ocean area is 10 times our land mass area. It's the second big project. The third, and actually probably the most immediate and the most important and the most immediately affecting jobs, is in actually reducing our use of fossil fuels in heat, in actually particularly in our built environment. It is a forgotten, but it is, as you say, Brendan, the less sexy option. It doesn't require the big 400 million um, plant. It doesn't require the latest uh, smart uh, computer technology. 
But it actually, when you look at the work that Sustainable Energy Ireland has done in terms of where is the most effective reduction we can make, the most economically effective reduction in our emissions, it is in our buildings, and particularly retrofitting existing buildings. So that, I'd say, is probably the most immediate, the most achievable, and the most significant in employment terms and, e and economic terms of the three main economic opportunities we have in the energy area. This report, as I said, builds on the thinking that we've been doing ourselves. They're, they're coming together and mixing up and coming out, I think, with a common sense of where we need to go. We're already starting. I mean, we're out this year going into about 30,000 homes. I know that's not enough when you look at the scale of the number of houses that are poorly designed, poorly fitted for our cold climate. But it's a multiple of what it was just two years ago. There are 3,000 contractors working on that. Because every householder that's taking part is actually saving money and cutting back on the six billion fossil fuel import bill that we have. But we need to go further, and that's what this report sets out, is the options as to how we go further. It's similar, I'm glad to say, with some of the commitments we've given in our renewed programme for government. We want to work with the banking sector now. We've already agreed that there are certain lending provisions uh, for new green funds. I think one of the best lending opportunities coming from a banking background, as I do, is actually in this area. That we can particularly look at our public buildings, looking at our hospitals, our schools, our prisons, every single public building, and try and use such funding to actually make the capital investment to retrofit those buildings and pay off the loan over the six, seven, eight years, whatever it is, where the savings are then accrued. It, to me, is a slam dunk, best bet investment in these times. And I want to see that happening. I think it's contained within the options here. Similarly, we are looking at putting obligations on our utility companies for demand reduction, similar to what's already been done in America and in Britain and elsewhere. And maybe say to them, can they go into the householders? And they're already starting to do it. And do a save as you pay scheme. So they may give the energy advice in terms of what needs to be done or get energy service companies to come in and do it take on the capital works that need to take place, and the payment for that is covered through the bill over the following six, seven, eight years. The customer actually, the savings make the payments, and that's the beauty of it because what it does is it gives us immediate economic stimulus, it gives us immediate job opportunities, and it prepares us for an energy world where oil production is going to peak and then contract, where gas is increasingly insecure, even though we're in a low price, benign environment at the moment in terms of availability of gas. If you look at the projection of what North Sea gas is going to do, which we get the vast majority of our gas from, it's going off a cliff. So we need to prepare for that future, and by reducing our home heating use of gas and our home heating use of oil, we prepare ourselves best for that uh, future. There are other options here, and other ways of us progressing this task, looking at our rental sector, not forgetting people in the rental sector are a crucial element, and seeing what schemes can we put in place, obligations can we put in place, how can we use our building energy rating system to leverage that to get warmer homes where people are more comfortable and are paying less bills. So the details in this report I think are extremely useful at this time as we actually go from concept into delivery, as we're actually going to put those ideas of energy reduction into practice and make it a, a large part of our, of our construction activity as our construction industry turns around. I think we are turning around. Confidence is the most important thing. I'd like to commend, as I've done before, Brendan Halligan and everyone else in the European Institute uh, for the support they gave in getting a yes vote in the Lisbon referendum. That, I think, had a tremendous effect in terms of our sense of ourselves as to what we're about and what we're going to do. We have a difficult time in the banking world at the moment, but I think we can manage it. But more than anything else, it is now about jobs. It's about a sense of people who may be out of a job or out of work having a sense that there is a future, that they're not going to languish in unemployment for a long period of time. And that behoves us in government and every institution, everyone involved with an interest in this state, to actually join this common purpose. It is a green energy future. It's what most countries are doing now. America's doing it. China's doing it quicker. And the European Union has committed real tough mandatory targets that sets the environment within which we work. So we, we, we would be fools not to take up this task and make it actually our main cause. Uh, this report adds to a lot of good policy work that's been done elsewhere. I want to commend Joe for the work he's done, for Brendan and the Institute for supporting it, 
for the European Climate Foundation for equally supporting it, and I look forward to delivering on it in government. Thank you. It's my uh, misfortune to have to follow two of the most silver-tongued orators in, um, in Irish politics, but um, I'll do my best. First of all, um, I'm not going to spend too long because you all have the report, so I'm sure you're all going to rush back to your offices and homes and read it in painstaking detail, but I would like to perhaps just take this opportunity to focus on some of the issues that jumped out at us as we were discussing this uh, proposal with experts and as we were undertaking our own research in the area. I suppose the first, the starting point is the overwhelming body of evidence which indicates that there actually is a deep reservoir of cost-effective energy efficiency measures available in the residential sector. And we focused on the residential sector not because we thought that it was the only sector that needs focus, but just purely for the purposes, for, you know, in terms of focusing our resources and our time, we just thought we'd focus on the, on the residential sector. And reports by the International Energy Agency, the Energy Saving Trust, the Energy Institute, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, sustainable, and our own Sustainable Energy Ireland have all... Re- published reports that are variations on this theme, that there are huge, a deep green reservoir of energy savings available that need to be harnessed and tapped somehow. But it wasn't just the research. We also talked to some of the um, retrofit companies, and I can see representatives here. For example, um, IHER Energy Services or Dirk and Ecofix, and we read some of their case studies. And two things took me about the case studies. The first, of, the first one was, of course, um, something that Brendan touched on, and that's the shocking state of some of our, of our homes and some of the places we live. Um, you'd need a nuclear reactor in the fireplace to get these, some of these homes up to um, an ambient air, qual- an adequate level of um, heating. And, and the other thing that, that struck us was where the deep software had been used to assess the, the implications of having a retrofit, you know, the, the, the remarkable level of savings that were available in a lot of these homes. And if, if there are savings available, the economists will ask us, I don't know if we have any of them here, but um, well, they will say, well, why don't people make these savings? If they're there already, why don't people just invest and take advantage of these opportunities themselves? And this is something that we've addressed in some detail in Section 2 of the report, and I would um, refer you to Section 2 if you want to explore that issue in some more detail. But I'll leave, um, I'll leave it to the International Energy Agency to summarize what it says. The market simply doesn't deliver all cost-effective savings. Policy is required. So with that starting point, we decided we, we, what we want to do is we want to propose um, a government-driven national energy efficiency retrofit program, a comprehensive government-driven um, program to tap these savings. So the first thing we did was we tried to estimate, well, what would be required to bring the buildings up within a, within a 10 to 15-year time frame to, we'll say, an average C1 rating? And we spent some time trying to estimate some figures for that, and the data is fairly sketchy. But we came up with a figure of approximately 14 to 15 billion euro would be required. And we estimate that it would be possible to bring the energy rating of the building up to, or up to an average C1 level within that time frame, 10 to 15 years. Then we looked in some detail at the benefits. And I think the benefits in terms of emissions savings, in terms of energy savings, in terms of health benefits, fuel poverty, and indeed the value of people's homes would be enormous. But I think that the real clincher in this area, given the economic crisis and the economic situation that we're currently in, is the 30,000 jobs that we feel could be created directly in the construction industry, not to mention the indirect and induced jobs that could be created. With 200,000 unemployed construction workers joining dole dole queues every week, I really think that there's an urgent um, onus on us to act to do something about that. So in terms of action, we we propose four options, and I wouldn't like to even suggest for a moment that uh, that these are options that we came up with ourselves. These are things that are being considered in the government's energy demand reduction target consultation. These are things that are being considered and have been brought into the public domain by Sustainable Energy Ireland, by, um, for example, Jeff Colley in Construct Ireland, and various other people. We're not claiming any sort of ownership over these ideas. We're just trying to draw together some of the things that were out there in the public domain and perhaps try and pull them together into a, into a coherent strategy. So the four options, one and two, would be utility-focused solutions. So they're mutually exclusive. You probably have to choose either or. 
but essentially what you're asking is the government to impose an energy demand reduction target on the utilities. The utilities would possibly uh, would the utilities would use an ESCO to deliver those savings, uh, an energy services company. But the key is that the savings would be delivered at no cost, no upfront costs to the homeowner, because the upfront cost to the homeowner, if you look at if you look at section two, this is one of the key difficulties that has to be overcome in this area. Now, of course, there's a question of financing there. Who provides the financing? And that's something that we've left open. We haven't come up with any definitive answers on that, but we've looked at exploring some options. Could government help underwrite the risk? Could we use perhaps a green bonds issue or a green bank or some other way to facilitate the financing to make it more attractive to the main players, to the utilities, to deliver the magnitude of change that we think is, is possible? Um, but one of the main pitfalls with this approach is, I think, surrounds the role of the ESCO. And I really think if you take, for example, the Energy, Energy Efficiency Institute, what they estimate is that energy use in buildings can be reduced by 30% just using the existing hardware that's out there. But we can go a lot deeper than that. And the way we go a lot deeper is... Um, to quote the Energy Efficiency Institute, much more can be achieved through fully integrated smart building technologies... This includes an array of sensors, energy-saving devices, and new technologies which are coming onto the marketplace all the time. But to harness those savings, you need a sophisticated ESCO. You need an ESCO that will go, into, go, go to a homeowner and will be able to provide a sophisticated and comprehensive range of proposals that work together to deliver these very deep energy savings. And I think that whatever way we use this energy demand reduction target, it has to incentivize the emergence of this smart, one-stop sh one shop um, energy services company. And we've provided some initial thoughts on that in option one, particularly of the proposal. But again, I would stress that these are only initial, um, initial thoughts. But I think it's very, very important that we realize that an energy demand reduction target by itself will not leverage the amount of investment that is required. We need a much more comprehensive strategy than that instrument could possibly deliver. And so that's why we've looked at other options, two of which the minister mentioned. The first one is regulation. And I think in particular in relation to some market sectors, that there is no incentive to make energy efficiency investments. For example, the private rental sector, there's absolutely no incentive whatsoever for a landlord to invest in the energy efficiency upgrade. He's not paying the energy bills. So we think in this case there's a clear role for government intervention, using, as the minister said, the BER perhaps, to leverage private sector investment in that property. The landlord can recoup the costs by, by way of an increased rent, which wouldn't be too popular for people like me who actually are in the rental sector. But, and, um, you know, the, 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 the tenant will be able to recoup that to some extent through reduced ex energy bills. I think that the other option is, is the use of exchequer finances, which isn't something that's very popular at the moment to suggest that exchequer finances should be used for any sort of a public sector program. But within the context of the introduction of a carbon tax in the December budget, the implications, particularly on fuel poverty, are well known and, um, have, and ESRI have been in research for the last 10 years pointing out how revenues from a carbon tax can be used to offset the negative socioeconomic consequences. Some say that the benefits, household benefits, should be increased, but what we're saying is that makes absolutely no sense. You have to find a mechanism whereby the negative economic or socioeconomic consequences can be offset through the, through the rollout of energy efficiency programs in the social housing sector. So those are the three instruments that we think can be used together to deliver this type of program, this overall strategy, to leverage the $14 billion over the 10 to 15 year period that can, um, that can make this program happen. So in conclusion, I suppose it's hard to talk about anything at the moment without mentioning the recession, but I think that the recession is often portrayed as something that's happening to us and something that we're defenseless against. But I think that how we respond and how we re use the resources that are under our control will have a hugely significant impact. But if I may share one of my nightmares with you, one of my nightmare scenarios is that as we drag ourselves out of this financial crisis and we slowly get ourselves on the road to recovery, that we're going to be hit by another crisis, an energy crisis. I don't know if anybody has seen the recent UK government-funded report by the Energy Research Council. It's possibly the most authoritative report on oil supply, and it evaluates 500 other studies on oil supply. And it concludes that there is a significant risk of peak oil, that it will be reached in the period before 2020. 
I'm not one personally to, to go on about peak oil, but when I read this report, I mean, it is a dramatic warning. And if we fail to act, we can't say that we haven't been warned. Not, uh, 2020 is, is, is 10 years away, and there's a significant risk that, you know, that we will be we'll be reaching some sort of a supply crunch with the price implications that, that entails in the very short or in the very near future. And I think that the last thing about the national retrofit program of our residential housing stock is it is a massive hedge against this possibility, and it would help us to insulate it helped to insulate us from the worst impacts of an energy crisis. So yes, I think that the level of the program outlined here in this report, to my knowledge, is more ambitious than anything that has been proposed anywhere or that is being rolled out anywhere in the world. But I don't think that just because it's more ambitious, that should deter us. I think that bold action in these difficult times is required. And I think that it's incumbent on us, actually, to go further than anybody else has gone before. And that we can set Ireland as an exemplar for what can be achieved. Um, I have a few scribbled notes here <laughs> at the end. Um, so, I don't know, for those of you who've read the Programme for Government, the revised Programme for Government, a lot of the things that this report touched, touches on have been signalled in the Programme for Government. And I actually think that writing this report was like pushing against an open door. Everybody we talked to, to a certain extent, was, was, was moving in the same direction on this. Of course, people are going to have concerns about various aspects, but I think that if you look at the back of the report, it's not often you see... Um, Oshin Coughlin, Tom Parlin, John Mullins, Patrick McManus, Gabriel Darcy, these kind of people all out supporting uh, a, a proposal like this. I don't know if Oshin Coughlin and um, Tom Parlin have ever agreed on the back of any publication <laughs> uh, together. So just very briefly before I finish, um, I'd like to thank, as Brendan said, all of the people who helped in the drafting of this report. Uh, particularly, but not exclusively, I'd like to thank everyone, all my colleagues in the IEA, IEA who have had to put up with me for the last four months. Um, I'd like to thank Brian, who did an uh, outstanding job on designing the report, and it's not actually my, uh, my fingerprint, it's his fingerprint. <laughs> and um, to, I'd like to thank Jill, who unfortunately is sick today. She really wanted to be here, uh, to, and she's been a great support throughout the lifetime of the project. And everybody else, there's about five or six other people in the IEA here who've been panicking with me trying to get this, uh, this report together for the last six months. So I'd like to thank them all especially. But also I'd like to thank the European Climate Foundation for their generous intellectual and financial assistance. Without them, um, we wouldn't have been able to take the time to draft this report. And of course, Sustainable Energy Ireland and the department who were welcomed us and welcomed this initiative with open arms and were very, um, provided um, their data, provided corrections, clarifications, saved me from embarrassing myself in public by making statements that had absolutely no basis in reality. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody else who played a role in, um, in this project. Thank you very much.